okay all right a very good evening to everyone so this session is this live session is uh, for week 12 and in this session we are going to revise all the tutorials that we have that we have solved so before we just revise all the tutorials let us have uh, let us solve two problems for uh, let us jab, just I want to give you hint for the two problems that are given in assignment number 12 sorry there is a mistake Did not. Okay, so for the in the assignment 12, in the question number 5, you have to determine the rated voltage and current of the solar cell at 25 degrees Celsius. So, for how we will find the voltage of solar cell? So, for the expression for the voltage of a solar cell is given by this E0 is equal to ER minus. 0.0021 t minus 25 and that all the e naught and er are given in the volts so where e naught is the voltage in voltage in volts at temperature t degree celsius and er is the rated voltage in volts of the cell at temperature 25 degree celsius so in the problem i think uh, In the problem given data are ER, ER is given and then T is given and you have to find find E naught so if you use this expression you can easily get the value of E naught sorry sorry I uh, one minute so sorry E naught is given you have to find ER because E naught is the voltage at temperature T degree Celsius so here they have in the problem it is given as 45 degree Celsius and correspondingly voltage is given as 408 volt so so E naught is given at the temperature T degree Celsius that is 45 degree Celsius and you have to find the ER now for the current for the, to find the current of solar cell at 25 degree celsius here given data r i naught that is at t degree celsius 801 milliampere and T is given 45 degree Celsius and here you have A A is the surface area of solar cell in centimeter square A is also given that is 2 cent uh, yes 2 centimeter square A is given 2 centimeter square I naught is given and T is also given and you need to find IR Uh, good evening, sir. Yes, Tarminder. Uh, sir, uh, this is uh, regarding uh, assignment 12. Yes. 
Okay, sir. In the last in the last session, uh, Pradeep Dasani has asked doubts about question five and question five. So I I am just giving the hint so you can solve the problems. So here in this voltage expression, all the E naught and E R are given volts. While in this current expression, you have to take this I naught and I R in milli amperes, and this A in centimeter square. So these values are in milli ampere, and this A in centimeter square. I think now you will able to solve this problem. So no. this is the standard equation, and we have to yes. remember. Yeah, this is standard equation. For if you if the voltage and current for the solar cell at a certain temperature is given, then how at at uh, the standard temperature like room temperature twenty five degree Celsius, then how you can find the voltage at T degree Celsius. But in this expression, they have given the in the problem they have given at T degree Celsius, like 45 degree Celsius. I you need to find the voltage and current at of solar cell at 25 degree Celsius. So these are the standard expressions. So you need to remember, and you can use this expression to solve this problem. now for the problem number 6 in the question 6 a bind energy conversion system having this this six pole induction generator and the line frequency is 50 hertz and the bind speed is given 10 to the tsr so in this in this problem you have to find the transmission gear ratio so to find the transmission gear ratio We need to find the ratio of speed of generator rotor to a speed of turbine blades. So first, you have to find the ratio of generator rotor. Then, then you have to use this expression: one plus s into one twenty f divided by p, where s is the slip, and a slip is also given. Slip is given as three percent. That means you have to substitute zero point zero three, and then one twenty frequency is given as. 50 hertz and p is given as six pole. P is given as a number of that is number of poles that is given as six. Now you will get this uh, a speed of generator generator rotor in the RPM. So on substituting all these values, you will get the values in RPM. Now how you will find this? Uh, A speed of uh, turbine blades. So to find the speed of turbine blades, we will use this. Uh, uh, we will use this tip speed ratio lambda, and we know that tip speed ratio is the tangential rotor tip speed to the bind speed, and lambda in this problem. Lambda in this problem is given. Tip speed ratio is given as nine. And then this R, this R is also given. R is given as 25 meter. And then bind speed is given as 10 meter per second. From here, you will get the omega with the help of T T per speed ratio. you will get the omega that is angular speed in radian per second right you will get omega that will come as angular speed in radian per second
so you have to find the this angular speed rpm so how we will find angular speed in rpm you have to just convert radian and second in revolution per minute so angular speed in rpm upon getting omega so in one revolution how much radian in one revolution 2 pi radian so the 2 pi in by 16 one revolution is equal to 2 pi radian so in one radian it will be 1 divided by 2 pi right so it will be divided by 2 pi and then to convert second into minute you have to again divide by 60 so it will come upon top so mega into 60 divided by 2 pi so this will give the angular speed in rpm now you got the this uh, speed of generator rotor in rpm as we have calculated with the help of this first expression this expression n generator is equal to 1 plus s into 120 f by p and in this will be in turbine blades this angular speed of turbine blades the tip of rotor so this will be n2 this is speed of turbine blades in rpm so just substitute these values you will get the answer Okay, so this uh, I think we will be able to solve question 5 and question 6 for the assignment 12. I have given the hint and the expression used to solve these problems. I hope you, you will be able to solve the problems. Any doubt? If you don't have any doubt, then we can move to the revision part. Uh, sir, please give some hint regarding uh, question number two. Sir, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. sure, sure Dharmander. Yeah. What is question two? Two, two. Okay, question two, yeah. Question two is very easy. Okay, question, sir. Okay. Question two we have discussed in the last class, uh, last session. Means like here in this problem, you have to find the power electrical power output at cutting speed, rated speed, and cut out speed. So for cutting speed and rated speed, you have to apply the expression, and then at cut out speed, we know that electrical power output, whatever that rated speed, that will be equal to the that will be same at cut out of speed because it gets saturated we have seen this uh, power uh, curve for the various uh, speed for the wind turbine so you have to find the electrical power output at cutting a speed and rated a speed according to the expression we know that half rho uq into this power coefficient into this uh, efficiency of gearbox and generator and for rated a speed you have to just change the change this uh, uh, what this wind speed and that will be the same that the same electrical power output will be also at the cut out speed because after going beyond the trade speed this electrical power output will be same till the cut out speed and after cut out speed 
this you have to stop the turbine bullets so that is the concept behind this electrical power output at different uh, speed at different bind speeds so we have solved this type of problem in the last session so i think you will you, have, you can revise and solve the problems for uh, solve the problems based on the electrical power output for various uh, bind speeds so uh, i think uh, so in this session we are we are going to revise uh, the tutorials i have just want to clarify that i have just uh, i am just going to show you the slides uh, that are important but uh, it is not necessary that you have to fix to that only you have to go through all the sessions all the live session means all the nptel videos and all the tutorials and all the assignments it is not like that whatever covered revision session that is only important it is just a, a quick over, overview so that you just get familiar with all the topics in the uh, in this uh, subject so the uh, these are the co course contents and i have just divided all the sections in modules uh, for this revision session so we will quickly go through this module 1 module 2 module 3 and these have two sections part 1 and part 2 and module 5 module module 4 5 and 6 contains three sub part so i have divided all these things and this module 7 that is more theoretical based and more problems are based on the bind energy convergence systems so let us see this first part module one that is load characteristics and load management so in the load characteristics and load management first expression is that load factor and load factor is the ratio of average demand to the peak demand and if you see this load factor plays an important role for the utilities because on this like uh, if you see these various types of load like domestic commercial industrial and agriculture loads then you can see that domestic loads have lowest load factor 10 to 15 percent and industrial loads have highest load factor that is 60 to 65 percent and higher load factor is preferable to utilities that means average demand and peak demand should be close to each other so now if you in the problem if they find if they told you to find the daily load factor then in the in the problem it uh, they have given the data in this energy consumption so daily you can write the expression for daily load factor in the terms of energy conversion like daily energy consumed divided by total number of hours in a day that is 24 hour upon peak demand for the day now they may ask you to find this annual load factor then based on the energy consumption you can find uh, you can take it as total annual energy upon 8760 so in one year how many number of hours that is 8760 hours Three sixty-five days into 24 hours that is 807 hours so you divide by 8760 and annual peak demand and one unit of energy is equal to one kilowatt hour now load factor what is load uh, sorry what is load curve electrical load demand varies with time and the plot of load demand with respect to time is known as load curve and if you make this load curve on the terms of descending order of load magnitude then we called it a load duration curve and whatever 
if you find this area under both the curves load curve and load duration curve then it will give you amount of energy consumption and all are equal to each other and in the radial distribution system what uh, how you find the number of nodes the number of nodes is equal to number of lines plus 1 so this is about this load curve load duration curve and this how you can find the number of nodes now the other thing is that what is the difference between transmission and distribution net networks and there are so many problems based on this difference between transmission and distribution networks so in the topological point of view transmission network are meshed while distribution network are radial what do you mean by meshed meshed means a node in the network can get power from the two paths while in radial a node in the network can get power from the one one bay only not from the two sources while in the mesh they can get power from the two paths or multiple paths multiple sources and in transmission network this load is of radially balanced nature while in distribution network this loads are generally unbalanced in nature because we have single phase loads so household a single phase so they uh, accordingly it becomes unbalanced and for transmission network to get the balanced voltage at the receiving end we do the transposition of transmission lines so this uh, this uh, transmission lines are of transposed in net nature while distribution network are non transposed in nature now for power losses transmission network have been lower power uh, lower power losses since it is getting transmitted at higher voltage while distribution network the power losses are more because the current amount is higher and the voltage is low and fault occurrence transmission network having less fault occurrence while this distribution networks are more fault tol are are uh, more fault prone so coming to the next uh, part that is electrical load definition so electrical load is a device that consumes certain amount of power energy to accomplish certain task so that is defined as the electrical load and there are different types of loads based on the dependency of voltage constant power load constant current load and constant impedance load constant power load means power is constant regardless of voltage and uh, example for constant power load is the electrical motors we can see our submersible pump that is constant power load power is constant so if you increase the voltage then current will get reduced just vice versa if you decrease this voltage then current will increased so this is the characteristics of constant power load in the constant current load we know that power is proportional to vi and if current is constant that means power is proportional to voltage and examples for constant current load building units smelting electroplating processes sir and how to maintain the constant current we have here classified constant current load so these are the properties of loads i don't know this building units i have th seen this uh, in the uh, like uh, uh, in iron building units a smelting and electroplating process so the means uh, whatever uh, this doesn't matter that what is the voltage at the output for these loads it will extract certain amount of power the loads are of that, that type so it is not the control that uh, we have to maintain this constant current 
it is the characteristics of load okay sir now this constant impedance load i think most of the loads are of this constant impedance load and this in in this constant impedance load load power is proportional to voltage squared so this power is directly proportional to vi and then if we substitute i equal to v upon z then since impedance is constant then power is directly proportional to v square and the examples for constant impedance load are incandescent lighting resistive water heaters etc now another important expressions in the load characteristics and load management are diversity factor coincidence factor demand factor and load diversity so diversity factor you can easily remember that is the ratio of sum of individual peak demand upon the group peak demand so in the top you have to put the all in uh, summation of all the individual peak demands while in the denominator you have to put the aggregate peak demand and group peak demands is same as aggregate peak demand and this coincidence peak demand and this coincidence factor is reciprocal of diversity factor so just remember this one expression diversity factor that that is the ratio of sum of individual peak demand upon the group peak demand so accordingly you can find the coincidence factor coincidence factor is the reciprocal of diversity factor so uh, in the coincidence factor numerator will be group peak demand that's why group peak demand is same as this coincidence peak demand that's why this is coincidence factor while in diversity factor in the top we have to take the summation of all the individual peak demand or maximum demand while in coincidence factor numerator will be coincidence peak demand so you can correlate now this demand factor is the ratio of maximum demand to the total connected load there are less cost problems on demand factor so uh, you can also remember this expression demand factor is the ratio of maximum demand to the total connected load now coming to this load diversity load diversity is the is the subtracts is the difference of sum of individual peak demand minus group peak demand so diversity factor is the sum of uh, difference of sum of individual peak demand to the group peak demand it's like if you know the diversity factor then you have to just just do the subtraction of numerator with is with respect to uh, subtraction of denominator with respect to numerator so that is load diversity now how you can find the peak demand if this contribution factor and the individual peak demand is given so this is the expression of peak demand of the group that is also known as uh, coincidence peak demand or group peak demand so peak demand of group is determined as c1 into p1 max plus c2 into p2 max plus so on plus cn into pn max where this ci is the contribution factor it's very simple means like if you know the individual peak demand then you have to multiply with this contribution factor of that that entity uh, and so on you will get this aggregate peak demand pgr max our group peak demand or coincidence peak demand so all having the same name means if anyone tells group peak demand or aggregate peak demand
और एनिमन से कोइंसिडेंस पिक डिमांड दैट मीन्स इट इज सेम पी जी आर मैक्स इफ एनी वन इज फाइंडिंग दिस कॉन्सिडेंस फैक्टर देन यू हैव टू पुट एट द इन द नोमिनेटर पी जी आर मैक्स इफ एनी वन फाइंडिंग इज दिस डाइवर्सिटी फैक्टर लाइक वी हैव सीन द प्रीवियस क्वेश्चन देन यू हैव टू पुट दिस ग्रुप पिक डिमांड इन द डिनोमिनेटर नाउ we have seen one problem in which this table is given and you have to find this contribution factor then how you can find this contribution factor means table for the different entities different types of loads is given and they have different uh, maximum demand so what you can do first you have to find the aggregate peak demand for the different time instant this uh, upon finding this aggregate peak demand for the time instant then you can find the class contribution factor and the class contribution factor is the ratio of class demand at time of system peak upon class known coincidence maximum peak maximum demand so this is the contribution factor calculation if you have a data for different types of load and uh, at the different time instant so you can do this uh, simple two steps first you have to find the aggregate peak demand for the different time instant then uh, for, for different time instant you have to just add up the things and see the, at which time instant the group peak demand is occurring and based on that time instant you can find the class contribution factor by using this expression that is uh, ratio of class demand at time of system peak upon the class known coincidence peak demand now the last expression is the loss factor the loss factor is the average power is the ratio of average power loss to the power loss at peak load demand so it is uh, it is with respect to loss we know that load factor is the average demand upon peak demand so it is related to this load factor only if you know the load factor then you can also remember the loss factor expression we know that load factor is average demand upon peak demand so the loss factor is similar to this load factor in the loss factor it is the average power loss to the power loss at peak load demand now moving to the next part now the section lighting switch and tie line switches are very important for the power distribution networks and they have very significant role in the power distribution networks and power distribution planning so you have to you just expect problems from this section lighting switch and tie line switch switch definitely in the exam i think so section lighting switches we know that uh, these switches are normally closed type and tie line switches these switches are normally open type so nc means normally closed and tie line switches means normally open and section lighting switches used in the fault condition while tie line switches used in the emergency condition and maintenance condition because tie line switches i did tie line switches can uh, by closing this tie line switches we can take power from the other feeder area while this section lighting switches we can isolate some faulty part in that feeder area so section lighting switches gates open during fault condition while this tie line switches gets closed during maintenance condition or you can get power supply during the em emergency condition from the other feeders so you can say that it removes the faulty area therefore it improves the reliability 
and it is used in the fault isolation so uh, i have written twice and this tile line switch is used in service restoration like if in a certain instant you want if this your feeder primary feeder is not able to supply power then you can get power from the other feeders by closing this tile line switches so that you can say that used in service restoration so tile line switches are connected in a series with the supply switches uh, what you said yes tile line switches are connected in a sectionizing switches in series yeah it may be connected because here you can see this uh, switches are like this sectionizing switches uh, are he here you can see this for feeder two load area and this is feeder load feeder one load area so this switches are like uh, having one fuse is also in between but these are connected in series but it is not perfectly series how how i can say with what what respect you, you want to say you can explain then now you can no. get your problem so no, actually uh, in this diagram uh, just i uh, seen uh, somewhere okay. it is connected in series yes sir that's why no both have different purpose so uh, in a in a in a certain feeder area we cannot have tie switches for different area we have tie switches and uh, in to connect different feeder areas so that's that is the that is the part of the tie switch and isolation uh, cannot be in the at the same at the same point it is having different at different points so it has uh, i think no meaning with series or parallel okay sir now this uh, we know this distribution networks are of mostly radial topology which results in unidirectional power flow and the radial topology is fair, fair for its simplicity in construction cost effectiveness and protection arrangement and the other importance part is the circuit breaker and isolator the circuit breaker operates at no on load condition and this isolator operates at no load condition sorry for this mistake oh, where it went so coming to this next module that is power distribution network a brief brief overview sorry this is the second module we have moved to the second module this is power distribution network from the sectionizing tie line switches so there is no need to write here i got confused so moving to the next part that is demand side management so till here any doubt in this module 1 now we will cover this module 2 
we have covered this uh, sectionalizing switch and tie line switches that is also in module 2 now we are moving to this demand side management If you have any doubt, anything discussed, then you can interfere me. Now this demand side management, that means whatever all measures, programs and equipments and activities that are direct toward improving efficiency and cost effectiveness of energy usage on the customer side of the meter. So what, how this demand side management achieved? that is achieved by shaping this daily load characteristics either daily, weekly, monthly or annual load characteristics and this does not include the outage or interruption and there are various means of demand side management so demand side management that whatever things we are doing to improve the efficiency and cost effectiveness of energy usage on the customer side of the meter and there are various ways of demand side management dsm that is peak saving peak or peak clipping valley filling load shifting a strategic con conservation a strategic load growth or load building so first first is peak saving or peak clipping so you can see this figure peak saving or peak clipping means you are reducing the peak demand so upon if you reduce this peak demand that means you are re reducing the both the peak demand and the total energy consumption and example for this demand side management is that efficient control of air conditioners and water heaters now second is valley filling if you see this figure valley filling means you are increasing the increasing the lower lower demand occurring at the certain time stand so no change in the peak demand but increase in the total energy consumption and the one good example for this valley filling is that electric vehicles charging that is grid to vehicle now third is load shifting if you see this figure you are shifting the load from the peak uh, from the peak hours to non peak hours so you are shift in load shifting you are shifting the load from the peak hour duration to non peak hour duration so in load shifting reduction in peak demand but no change in total energy consumption and the examples for this load shifting is that defrable loads that is washing machine or dishwasher and with this load shifting you can increase the load factor because you are reducing the peak demand that's why load factor also gets increased and that is desirable for utilities now fourth is a strategy conservation conservation in a strategy conservation you are reducing the you are getting you are lower you are getting lower down this whole load curve so in the strategy conservation reduction in both peak demand and total energy consumption and it shifts the whole load curve downwards and the example for this strategic conservation is that efficient lightning and air conditioning now fifth is the fifth is a strategic load growth or load building that means you are shifting this whole load curve upwards so in this case it will increase in both peak demand and total energy consumption and it shifts the whole load curve upwards an example for this strategic load growth is the efficient planning of power distribution. Sir, in fifth case, uh, we are increasing the load, not. Uh... Yeah. What, Dharminder? Sir, uh, in fifth case, uh, uh, increasing the load. Uh, yeah, we are planning. We are plan. That is load growth. A strategic load growth because in the future the load demand will be more so this is how you can efficiently increase this load growth this future planning okay sir. yeah now 
now another thing is that some problems are based on this outdoor and indoor substation so one problem is that uh, here given for this outdoor and indoor substation in this uh, you have to tell that which of the following statements are true regarding indoor and outdoor substation and the options are outdoor substation has higher reliability compared to indoor substation so that is that is not true because outdoor substation are less reliable because there is higher chance of fault while uh, this second option is that outdoor substation needs higher maintenance compared to indoor substation if you see yes it is true outdoor substation requires more maintenance compared to indoor substation and and the c option is that outdoor substation is suitable for cities with higher population densities no it is incorrect so uh, for higher population density b prefer this indoor substation because it requires less space and d option is that outdoor substation is less expensive than indoor substation that is true outdoor substation is less expensive but it is less reliable also so that is both are contra contra to each other and you can see the difference between typical outdoor indoor substation this space requirement is more in outdoor substation and indoor substation requires less space and this cost is for establishing this outdoor substation is cheaper than indoor substation that's why we see more outdoor type substation and this maintenance requirement is more for outdoor substation because uh, since more fault fault prone the, uh, the substation are more fault pr prone and this fault location is easier because they we can see the equipments very easily while this fault location is little bit difficult in indoor substation because the equipments is enclosed and the liability for this outdoor substation is less than the indoor substation now moving to the next problem that is based on the tariff structure so just quickly go through this tariff structure so in the uh, nptel lectures uh, it has come this tariff structure i have discussed that are flat demand rate structure a constant price per kilowatt hour while this block meter rate structure that means lower prices for greater usage and this figure represents this block meter rate structure as you consumed more energy the prices will get reduced and then demand rate structure that is separate charges for demand and separate charges for power and energy for kilowatt and kilowatt hour and then season rate structure that higher prices from the from the name itself you can easily you can easily get the idea that in season rate structure higher prices per kilowatt hour used during the season when system peak demand occurs while this time of day a structure or peak log pricing means that higher prices per kilowatt hour used during the peak period of the day and lower prices during off period of peak period of the day so this problem is based on this block meter rate structure now moving to the next pro next part so so here uh, how we will decide this decide the length of the ruler uh, length of the feeder length of primary feeders so for ruler and for the highly dense area there are different criteria for deciding the length of the fe primary feeders so in the low load density areas like ruler areas we decide the length of primary feeders by this voltage drop rather than the thermal restrictions while this in high load density areas we decide the length of primary feeders based on the thermal limitations 
so this is obvious because in low load density areas we have this uh, power requirement is just parts and the and it is of generally higher in length so voltage drop is the primary criteria while this thermal limitation will not be the first criteria and this high load density area thermal limit with the major decisive factor because this demand is more in a certain in a just uh, in a just nearby area sir uh, thermal uh, limitation in transmission line or for distribution line i think Dist transmission distribution, line. distribution thermal limitation for distribution yes uh, this is we are talking about primary feeders so this is primary distribution uh, lines thermal limitation or ampacity limits both are same both have the same meaning more the current more will be the thermal uh, more will be the heat gen heat coming from this buyer now the next part is that k constant and based on this uh, k constant we have uh, different uh, pro we have solved different types of problems so how you can define this k constant k constant either yes me yes uh, actually regarding the question in the assignment okay Mm, yes. there was a question regarding the urban uh, feeder okay so we have chosen the answer for the urban feeder as the ampacity limit but uh, it was a multiple choice answer and the both voltage drop and the ampacity was considered as the answer for the assignment question so can you clarify on that which which assignment it, it was assignment 3 question number hmm, question number 5 What is the primary decisive factor? Loading of an urban distribution feeder. So we have discussed this in the class also, and based on that, the ampacity limit, which is equivalent to the thermal limit, was chosen. Okay, but uh, when the solution came, it was shown that it is both phase drop limit and ampacity limit, and that's the multiple uh, uh, choice answer. Can you clarify on that? Okay, so in this problem, if you see, yeah, so in this problem, it is also about loading, not only this length. So for loading, you have to see this ampacity limit also. So if you see the problem number five in the assignment three, they are asking about this. How, what is the primary decision factor for determining the permissible length and loading? So, for permissible length, we see this obvious. This is for permissible length and loading for urban distribution feeder. Then it should be ampacity limit, and uh, uh, when you use the term most, also it should be one answer. That is another thing. Uh, so what we have discussed in the assignment, we have chosen some this ambassade limit as the answer, uh, but uh, these two options can be the solution. I was having a doubt on that. That is why it's quite clear. I think uh, uh, it should be means uh, because since in this problem it is uh, both this uh, thing as asking this uh, permissible length and loading. So that's why both uh, they have given both the as the answer voltage drop limit and ampacity limit. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that uh, I will see this problem. I sorry for. Uh, I think I have to discuss with other teammates. But uh, this has been discussed. This this uh, problem has been in the last uh, uh, 
PMR, uh, this last in NPTEL lecture. So that's uh, the correct answer. But uh, for length and loading for urban distribution, the answer should be the answer should be ambient city limit only. I think uh, for for urban distribution. Yeah, practically we look only uh, industrial limits for urban and uh, yeah. rural we look for world type job. That is practically done. Practically done. Yeah. So I was having doubt with this answer. Anyway. So I will I think I need to discuss. There may be since it has two uh, choice uh, uh, multiple select question, that's why they put both of them as answer. I don't know. Sorry, I need to discuss with this to more get to get more clarification. Okay, okay. okay so we are here, we are discussing about the K constant. So uh, K, K, um, how you will define this K constant that is defined as the per unit voltage drop per kilovolt ampere mile. And this is the expression for this K constant R cos theta plus X sin theta into one third of thousand upon VR VVS. And this will give you voltage drop per unit per kVA mile. And if you just multiply it with 100, then you will get this voltage drop percentage voltage drop per kilovolt ampere per, per kilovolt ampere mile. And in this expression here, R is the resistance per unit length x is the reactance per unit length cos theta power factor and we are receiving it per phase voltage we are the base phase voltage so gokul i would suggest you to uh, you can write this problem in the uh, discussion forum okay. so that we can ponder upon it Because uh, all the uh, in discussion forum, all the team members can see this uh, doubt. Now this is the physical significance of K constant. If you see this uh, figure, that is the refer from the Turan Gonen book, Electrical Power Distress System Engineering. So this figure provides this K constant for various voltages and copper conductor sizes, and this. F figure is developed for these three phase overhead lines with an equivalent of 37 inch between the conductors and as the line voltage increases this K constant decreases for each copper conductor sizes. So you can see here uh, this line volt upon increase this line voltage this K constant decreases since this K constant depends this voltage drop per unit per kVA mile per kilo uh, this uh, voltage drop is the per unit voltage drop per kilovolt ampere mile so this upon increasing this line voltage this case constant should decrease for each for different types of copper conductor sizes now and here if you see this upon increasing this cross section area of the conductor then k constant decreases for each voltage levels because this cross section conductor increases and this voltage drop also gets decreases now for this power loss and voltage drop competition of radial feeder with informally distributed load so this uh, is a primary feeder having different laterals and loads are represented using these nodes so you can you can find this voltage drop by using this expression half of ISZL so the voltage drop if you uh, voltage drop will be similar to a lump loop load connected at the midpoint of the feeder that is x is equal to L upon 2 so this is the effective length for the radial feeder with informally distributed load that is L by 2. Now for if you find this total power loss then it will uh, if you find this total power loss for this radial feeder having uniformly distributed load 
and this is per phase power loss then this power loss will be half of is square rl so you can say that this power loss will be simpler to a lump load connected at one third of length of the feeder now this is the generalized expression for voltage drop of the main feeder that is k into lesn where this k is percentage voltage drop per kva kilometer of the feeder and le is the effective length of the feeder and sn is the kva load served by one of the end feeders here one problem is based on this expression like this an 8 mile long feeder is supplying a 2500 kva load of uniform load density and rectangular service area and if the k constant feeder is given as 0.001% voltage drop per kva mile determine this percentage voltage drop of in the main so k is given as this one and l length of the feeder is given as 8 mile so l upon 2 8 mile upon 2 and this sn this load uh, this load served by this feeder is 2500 kva so upon substituting all these values you will get as 1% as the answer sir you have done here l by 2 why sir in formula kle so I, i i told you this one like for this rectangular service area like for radial feeder with uniform distributor distributor like this effective length is l by 2 l is the effective length of feeder this yes, you always take a 1 by 2 if you have rectangular service area and uniformly load density then you have to take the le as l by 2 because you can assume all the loads lumped at this lumped at the okay. distance of l by 2 like this is the circuit breaker and then this all loads you can assume as here that is 2500 kva 2500 kva load you can assume it here so that that, that is the significance of effective length, effective length so it is le and le is l by 2 because here in this uh, informally distributed load with having a rectangular service area you cannot f- you cannot uh, like uh, you cannot f- find just uh, with respect to all the nodes you have to use this uh, you can refer this class nodes they have how they have derived this uh, expression k l into sn did you get my point yes sir okay so uh, this is for the rectangular service area effective um, how you can find this uh, voltage drop for the, uh, effective length for rectangular service area now we will see for the informally distributed load for the triangular service area and in some cases it also it also says like that increasing load density that is non informally distributed load so for this case voltage drop is 2/3 of is zl now we can say that to, de- to determine the voltage drop the total load current is assumed to be concentrated at 2 l upon 3 so this is the effective length for this informally distributed load with triangular service area so for rectangular service area effective length is l by 2 while for triangular service area effective length is 2 l upon 3 now if you if you need to find this total power loss for this informally distributed load with triangular service area then you can use this expression 8 upon 15 is square into rl and to determine this power loss the total load current is assumed to be concentrated at x is equal to 8l upon 15 now for uh, for general case like sub- substation service area with in primary feeders and here we have assumed n greater than equal to 3 so how you can find this area served by one of n feeders 
the expression for area served by one of n feeders is n is equal to ln square tan theta where theta is equal to 360 degree upon 2n and here n is number of primary feeders and if n is equal to 1 we can see this tan 180 is equal to 0 and if n is equal to 2 tan 90 is equal to infinity in this way you can also say that this all expression is valid for n greater than or equal to 3 here ln is the linear dimension of the primary feeder service area now how you can find this kva load survey one of n feeders the expression for kva load survey one of n feeders is sn is equal to d into an and sn is kva and d is load density that is kva per mile square and an is mile square the unit for an is mile square so you will get this uh, kva load survey one of n feeders is kva now how you can find this percentage voltage drop of the main feeder the same expression we have discussed previously that is k l into s n and we have seen this like for number of prime feeder greater than 3 we have triangular service area so effective load is 2 upon 3 ln you can say that total or lump so some load is connected to point one on the main feeder at a distance of two-third of ln from the feed point now upon substituting all these values like le sn we will get this generalized expression for percentage voltage drop for substation service area with n primary feeders like this k into two-third of d ln q tan 360 degree upon 2n so like is uh, if you having this a uh, square substance service area then theta will come as 45 degree and then you will get tan theta as 1 and the, accordingly you will get percentage voltage drop as k into two third of d into l4q now for hexagonal substance service area where n is equal to 6 so you will get theta is equal to 30 degree and accordingly you will get tan 30, 30 is equal to 1 upon root 3 so percentage voltage drop will be k into 2 upon 3 under root 3 d l 6 q now for this octagonal service substance service area that means number of primary feeders is 8 so theta will be 22.5 degree and tan theta will be 0.4142 so uh, important is that a square substance service area and hexagonal substance substance service area octagonal substance service area is not that much important so here you can see this rectangular service area the effective length for rectangular service area is l upon 2 while for triangular service area effective length is 2 l upon 3 and both this service area having uniform load density now how you will use this use and interpret this voltage drop formula so we know that this percentage voltage drop formula is k le into sn and for this triangular service area k into two third ln sn so this if you increase this if you double the length of feeder that means area served by one of the feeders will get extended to four times so this total kva total K, uh, total kva will be increased four times therefore percentage voltage drop will also will get uh, will get uh, eight times more than the previous one because four times this total kva served and this length of feeder is gets twice now if you increase the load density then this total kva gets doubled also accordingly this percentage voltage drop gets doubled now if you are adding new feeders that means number of feeders is twice if you are having number of feeders twice then area survey one feeder will gets reduced will gets half so sn 
so it gets half accordingly this percentage voltage drop will also gets half now figure feeder reconducting that means you are playing with this k if it gets half k will if k gets half then this percentage voltage drop will also gets half so this is for till module 2 any doubt till module 2 now we will go to module 3 i think this is the longest module module number 2 Dharmendra, Piridasani, Gokul and Alex Sir, uh, an exam uh, problem will be mixed like theory and uh, numerical Yeah, it will be mixed Actually on the same day I have to, uh, another one paper control engineering subject so. Okay, in the, in the first half or second half? Control engineering first half and uh, this subject is in second half yeah, don't worry, means uh, NPTV exams are very easy, means uh, like you have, if you are, if you have covered the tutorials, if you are covered the most important assignment, if you have covered the assignments, then tutorials and then class, uh, class lectures, definitely first is the class lectures, you have to, uh, and then how you will solve the assignment, class lectures and you have all the slides just to go through once or twice, you will definitely get uh, more than 90%. NPTEL exams are easier because you have uh, solved this assignment problems. So in NPTEL exam, you will definitely get similar type of problems in whatever you have solved in assignment. So no need to worry too much. Just have a quick short notes and you will just remember all the important expression that you may forget in the exam. Now moving to this next part. Module 3 Part 1 Reliability Assessment of Distribution Networks So there are various types of reliability indices like uh, indices for sustained interruption, indices for momentary interruptions and load and energy based indices So sustained interruption, SIFI, SIDI, CAIFI, CAIDI, ASI, ASIDI, CTIDI So these are important and for Momentary interruptions, we have not discussed reliability indices for momentary interruptions and then we have load and energy based indices that is energy not served, average energy not served and then average cumulative, I think some, I forgot this person, ACCI. So let us see all these reliability indices. So before we see this expression for all the reliability indices, just we have important reliability notations. So first is NT, that means total number of customers served. And the second is the Sigma NI, that is total number of customers interruption. And this NT most in many problems, it is given in the problem only. And this total number of customer interruptions, you have to get it from this uh, table. And this total number of customer interrupted, we denote it as CN. And in CN, the customer is counted once regardless than of the number of times interrupted. So these two are very important. The total number of customer interruptions and total number of customer interrupted. Means for a certain fault, for a certain fault, this customer is counted, one customer is counted, it, it, it would not be counted in another fault. So in CN, the customer is counted once regardless of the number of times it gets interrupted. And then we are having customer interruption duration that is denoted as sigma ri ni where this ri is the instruction time for each interruption event and the last is total connected load it is also given in the problem that is lt now this reliability indices SIFI, SIFI system average interruption frequency index that is the ratio of total number of customer interruption to the total number of customers served that means sigma ni upon nt so and then next we have psi the system average interruption duration index so it is the ratio of customer interruption duration to the to the total number of customers served now we have kaifi that means customer average interruption frequency index that is the 
रेशियो ऑफ टोटल नंबर ऑफ कस्टमर इंटरप्शन अपॉन टोटल नंबर ऑफ कस्टमर इंटरप्टेड सो कैफी सिगमा एन आई अपॉन सी एन एंड देन कायदी कस्टमर एवरेज इंटरप्शन ड्यूरेशन इंडेक्स दैट इज द रेशियो ऑफ कस्टमर इंटरप्शन ड्यूरेशन अपॉन टोटल नंबर ऑफ कस्टमर इंटरप्शन सो कायदी सिगमा आर आई एन आई अपॉन एन आई एंड दिस कायदी इज द रेशियो ऑफ साइदी एंड साइफी यू कैन से now we have this energy not supplied we can write this expression for l average i i r i where l average i the average load connected to load point i and r i the restoration time for each interruption event and then we are having with average energy not supplied that is the ratio of total energy not supplied upon total number of customers served so average energy not supplied is the ratio of energy not supplied upon total number of customers served that is nt and you substitute this ENS and NT value, you will get ANS. Now ACCI, average customer curtailment index, that is the ratio of total energy not supplied upon total number of customer interrupted. So this is the ACCI expression, that is the ratio of ENS upon CN. So uh, I think we have, we have discussed in the tutorial session, then that this like SIFI and SIDI are related to the interruption are the interruption statics over the entire customer base to the system so here we are taking with respect to nt and nt the total number of customers served so whatever the indices that is related to the over entire customer base that is with respect to the total number of customers interrupted that is nt total number of customers served that is nt over the entire base now some relevant indices are with respect to this customer like CAFI, CTI, ID. So here we are we are taking with respect to CN that is the total number of customers get interrupted and in CN we don't count the customer twice those gets interrupted in different type of interruptions. Now another exp uh, expression for reliable, another reliability indices are ASI average service availability index that is the ratio of customer hour service availability upon customer hour service demand into 100% and you can substitute you can have this expression for ASI and then ASIDI average system interruption duration index that is the ratio of total energy not supplied upon total connected load that is the ratio of ENS upon LT and LT the total connected load and then we are having CTID customer total average interruption duration index that is ratio of customer interruption duration upon total number of customer interrupted. So CTI is hybrid of C CAIDI and is calculated the same except that the customer with multiple interruptions are counted only once. So if you see this CTID and this CAIDI here denominator is sigma ni while this ctid the denominator is cn so sigma ni is the total number of customer interruptions while cn is the to uh, total number of customer interrupted so both have different many in ctid the customers are counted only once while in sigma ni the customer are counted multiple with respect to different interruptions now these are reliability indices now we are solving this uh, problems based on this uh, based on the uh, we are solving the problems based on this uh, mean time to failure mean time to repair and then availability unavailability and the systems are connected in series parallel i think you are talking about this one right dharmender yes sir <laughs> yes sir okay so this is not uh, very tough this is also simple actually statement uh, problem statement uh, sometimes we uh, got confused ki, uh, how to take the r mu and other parameters yeah if time allowed uh, please uh, uh, do practice some uh, numerical problems in last if time allows sir yeah sure 
so this here is just you have to solve uh, i think solve the assignment problem and tutorial problem you will definitely solve solve in the exam also because all the problems are based on the expression you don't have to put any mind so mean time to failure means it is limited by m bar so mean means average so we are taking bar so m bar is equal to 1 upon lambda and lambda is the mean failure rate so if you are taking this uh, time the recipro uh, rec reciprocal of time then it will be rate so lambda is the mean failure rate and mttf is the operation time or up time mean time of failure is also called as the operation time or up time because for this time duration this this uh, entity in is in operation or it is working for the it is providing the service while this mean time to repair it is represented by r bar and it is the it is the reciprocal of mu and that is mean repair rate mu is the mean repair rate so how you can say this mean uh, and then what is the expression of mean time in failure so mean time between failure is the summation of mean time to failure plus mean time to repair so means sir uh, for this time a t bar uh, service is not available mean time between failure no no this will counts both the operation time and the repair time so like this one in the this for this time duration mean time to failure for this time duration it is the uh, from here it starts working so till this time like suppose this is time a scale so from here it starts working so any entity starts working then it gets operated till this time and here it gets it gets for uh, it it got gets failure so upon fa upon failure so how much time it takes to repair so this is the repair duration so both these times if you sum up then it will comes mean time between failure so it is the summation of both mean time to failure and mean time to repair and this mean time between failure is also called as mean cycle time did you i think you did not get it so during this time uh, service is available or not sir mean time between failure uh, service is you cannot say that uh, this uh, for whole time duration the service is uh, available because mean time to repair this obvious this uh, for mean uh, for repair duration this this cannot serve provide service because it gets already faulted so it uh, this uh, entity gets time to repair and after repairing you again put the put it back in service so that's i repent here so after getting repair it again put into service so this is called the mean cycle time for a certain entity okay sir so like the same rep at this at this instant you put a certain entity in operation in put in the power distribution system and till this point of time it gets working perfectly and from it at this point it gets it gets uh, fault it gets failure so it requires time to repair so it require uh, till this time it is uh, it is not in operation it goes uh, somewhere or like you, uh, you repaired this for duration so after so repairing means, uh, you again put in back in service it means uh, uh, it is in service uh, like a uh, mean time to failure yeah it is in service that i told you the mean time to failure is the operation time or up time this 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 uh, statement you can read mean time to failure is the operation time or up time for this yes, time sir. it is in operating so the mean cycle times defines the average time it takes for the component to complete one cycle of operation that is failure repair and restart so the mean cycle time the average time that taken by the component to complete this one cycle operation that failure 
रिपेयर एंड री स्टार्ट सो टी बार रिप्रिंटेड एम बार प्लस आर बार नाउ एवेलिटी एंड अनएवेलिटी सो बोथ एवेलिटी एंड एवेलिटी सम ऑफ बोथ विल गिव यू ऑन एवेलिटी मीन्स दिस फ्रैक्शन ऑफ टाइम कंपोनेंट इज अप और हेल्दी एंड अनएवेलिटी मीन्स द फ्रैक्शन ऑफ टाइम कंपोनेंट इज डाउन सो how you will find unavailability that unavailability means when this time when this uh, component gets repaired so mean time to repair upon mean time between failure so unavailability is the ratio of mean time to repair upon mean time between failure so r bar upon r bar plus m bar and for constant failure rate and repair rate you be, you put this r bar is equal to 1 upon mu and m bar is equal to 1 upon lambda you will get unavailability as lambda upon lambda plus mu in similar way you can find availability that for the fraction of time the component is up or healthy so uh, for what uh, for what time it is in a healthy condition that is mean time to failure upon mean time to between failure so in the numerator it is mean time to failure and in the denominator it will be total time duration or mean cycle time so mean time to between failure is the mean time to repair plus mean time to failure so m bar upon r bar plus m bar and for constant failure rate and repair rate it will be mu upon lambda plus mu so from here you can get it uh, dharmendra because availability you have to take with respect to mean time to failure because for this fraction yes. time component is up or healthy in condition and while yes, unavailability the component is in down condition so it is taken with respect to mean time to repair now now uh, if different repairable components are connected in series then and and they have their data are given then how we will find the reliability for these components so the expression for mean time to failure for these components is m bar series that is 1 upon sigma lambda i uh, sigma lambda i that is lambda 1 plus lambda 2 so on and therefore mean failure rate will be lambda series equal to 1 upon m bar series and mean time to repair is sigma lambda into ri upon sigma lambda i and mean repair rate that is reciprocal of mean time to repair now for this reliability of repairable components in parallel if the components are repairable components are connected in parallel then how will find the mean time to failure and mean time to repair so m bar parallel will be denoted by this expression and this r bar parallel will be denoted by this expression and correspond correspondingly failure rate and repair rate will be taken as the reciprocal of mean time to failure and mean time to repair respectively so all the expressions are uh, you can remember but i would suggest that be careful while applying this expression for repairable components in parallel if you are finding this mean time to failure mttf because in this expression if lambda you have put uh, uh, in problem they have given lambda in faults per year while this r bar that is mean time to repair is given in hours so you have to co convert all the units in the same so that you can get the answer in that unit Bec uh, you can approach two way since lambda is given in faults per year then you can convert mean time to repair that is given in hours you can convert in years so you will get m bar parallel mean time to failure in years per fault now if you substitute this lambda if you convert now in the second case you can convert lambda that is given faults per year to faults per hour and this mean time to repair you can just keep as it is that is in hours so you will get mean time to repair sorry mean time to failure in hours per fault and uh, and in the last also you can convert mean time to failure in uh, that is coming as hours per fault to years per fault by substituting one year is equal to 8760 hours so you have to be careful with the units because in other expression 
if you put this uh, units it will get cancelled out with numerator and denominator so no problem in other expression but in this expression you have to you have to put all the units in the same uh, in the same time scale so just be careful while applying this expression for mean time to failure for repeatable components in parallel because you have to put all the all the all the values in that same time scale uh, since uh, the numerator and denominator part do not get cancelled out with the units yes sir i have mi uh, done mistake here <laughs> yes. in a previous yeah that's fine yeah no problem now uh, some problems are based on this uh, if this reliability for for a component is given then how will find this reliability for the whole combination for all the whole system if you have series system then it is reliability of uh, equivalent reliability of a path will be r upon n and if you have a parallel system then reliability will be 1 minus 1 minus r 1 minus r so on if it is different r1 r2 r3 then it will be 1 minus 1 minus r1 into 1 minus r2 and so on and here also in series system if it is different r1 r2 r3 it is gets multiplied r1 r2 r3 and so on now moving to the next module that is various power quality issues of power distribution network and introduction module 3 part 2 so i hope tarmender a little bit get uh, clarification in this module 3 part 1 yes sir yes sir now we do the more uh, solve the problem then uh... maybe clear mode yeah just solve uh, two or three problems it will be okay and one sir no one thing uh, reconfiguration of power distribution system reconfiguration reconfiguration i think that is all theoretical types problems there yes sir because the power system uh, planning and uh, uh, power distribution system planning and reconfiguration sometimes sir uh, i think options are like uh, same but uh, i got the wrong answer okay reconfiguration yes please so this uh, uh, in power quality issues uh, you just go through this lecture slides and here some important points which needs theories so which needs some notes that i have put here so like uh, this this problem you can see that which of flowing is a compensation type power quality improvement device used in the distribution system and the options are solid state vehicle dvr statcom upfc uh, sorry this is statcom so statcom is in this uh, and this uh, this uh, transmission system so it will not answer upfc is not since upqc is using this distribution system so dvr is the only answer and the custom power device used for power quality improvement you can bifurcate into two types reconfiguration type compression time and the compression type we are having this uh, usually called as switch gear and they include this current limiting current breaking and current transferring devices and it includes this solid state breaker solid state current limiter and solid state transfer switches and this again and second one the compression time this type of devices either compensate a load that is correct its power factor and balance or improve the quality of supplied voltage and the option and the example for this compression time to our quality improvement in this systems are distribution statcom dvr dynamic voltage restorer unified power quality condi conditioner this ds statcom is used in this is used in series with the in the series static compressor while this uh, this dvr is the used used in the parallel and this series and parallel combination together will make it as unified unified power quality conditioner so ds statcom is series compensator while this dynamic voltage stored is parallel compensator and this unified power quality conditioner is combination of both series and parallel compensator now 
uh, what are the different voltage variations for short duration and long duration short duration voltage variations that sustains for a few cycle up to one minute and technically classified as voltage cycle swell interruptions while long duration that sustains for period more than one minute and it can classified as over voltage under voltage and sustain interruptions now moving to the next part next module that is load flow analysis of radial distribution networks so in this load flow distribution networks these are steps we follow and and this uh, in the uh, in the PTL lectures, this forward, backward, sweep load flow algorithm has been covered. So how how you can go, how you can how you can find how you can do this forward and backward sweep load flow algorithm. First, you have to calculate the current for each load, and that is given by PI minus GI upon VI conjugate. So this is the derivation for this uh, load current at bus I. And next, we will find the line current starting from the end of the fitter. So that's why it is called from the backward suit because we start from the end of the fitter. And in the next step, we will find this voltage at each bus node starting from the first word that is forward sweep because we are starting from the starting. So we go forward in the forward direction while in the backward suit, we go in the backward direction. We start from the back end and we go backward. And what are the things uh, we do in backward sweep and forward sweep? In backward sweep, we determine the branch or line current and it is application of KCL. And here computation starts with end nodes or terminal nodes and it requires more computation because it contains two expression. While in forward sweep, to determine the bus voltage, it is application of KVL and computation starts with the select node. And what are the termination criteria for forward backward sweep load flow algorithm? So, termination criteria is that to, we have to set maximum number of iteration which need to be exceeded, and error in node voltage from previous iteration to current iteration that is measure of convergence. If it is less than this tolerance value, then we have to terminate the program. These are the two termination criteria for the forward, forward backward sweep load flow algorithm. Now we are moving to the next module that is reactive power compensation of distribution system with some capacitors. I think you have you are well familiar with this type of uh, compensation with the help of sand capacitors. So this is power triangle and from this power triangle you can find this power factor. And if you are doing the sand capacitor with the help of reactive with the help of uh, sand cap uh, if you are doing the reactive with the help of sand capacitors how this reactive power gets changed and you can find this uh, power factor from this power triangle so this is the example for power factor correction example so, and how this power how this reactive power effect on the power factor we can see this uh, upon uh, taking this active power same and if you are degrading this power factor you can see this reactive power gets gets increased and now in the second case we have we have taken the apparent power constant and upon upon degrading this power factor we having this active power gets re reduced and this reactive power gets increased now this concept of lead, leading and lagging power factors this depends upon the direction of flow of reactive power and for load this uh, if power factor is lagging that means inductive load and this that means that q is positive and that means load consumes power, reactive power it sim if simply retains it consumes reactive power then you have to take this as lagging reactive power and vice versa that means it supply load supply leading reactive power and if power factor is leading, that means it is capacitive load, and Q, you have to represent Q as negative. The Q is com Q comes as negative, and it the that means load supply reactive power, and 
दैट मीन्स लोड सप्लाई लैगिंग रेक्टिव पावर एंड वाइस वर्षा ऑन कॉन्ट्ररी लोड कंज्यूम्स लीडिंग रेक्टिव पावर सो दिस इज द साइन कन्वेंसन साइन कन्वेंसन इज पॉजिटिव फॉर लोड इफ कंज्यूम्स रियल रेक्टिव पावर दैट इज द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ लोड एंड साइन कन्वेंसन पॉजिटिव फॉर जनरेटर इट सप्लाई रियल और रिएक्टिव पावर सो दैट इज द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ जनरेटर सो द बेसिक सिग्निफिकेंस द वाट इज द मेन वर्क ऑफ लोड एंड जनरेटर लोड लोड मीन्स इट इट कंज्यूम समथिंग सो इट यू हैव टू टेक द साइन कमस पॉजिटिव एंड वाट इज द वर्क फॉर जनरेटर इट हैज टू सप्लाई सो इट इफ इट इज सप्लाइंग देन यू हैव टू टेक द साइन कन्वेंसन एज पॉजिटिव सो फॉर जनरेटर एंड लोड दिस टेबल यू कैन सी दिस क्यूज पॉजिटिव मीन द सप्लाई रेक्टिव पावर and supply negative power you can just quickly go through this table now we are having reactive power compressor compressor distribution system with sund capacitor here we have to define lambda and lambda is the ratio of reactive current at the end of line segment to the reactive current at the beginning of line segment and for informally distributed load that means for informally distributed load, means that at the end of line segment this current will be zero so lambda will also come as zero and for lump load that means all the current is whatever the current at beginning of line segment the current will be same at the end of line segment so i2 will is equal to i1 and lambda equal to 1 and alpha is taken as the reciprocal of 1 plus lambda plus lambda square now we define another term c degree of capacity compensation and c is defined as the ratio of kva of capacity installed to the total reactive load that is ic upon i1 so this is an analytical method for single capacitor bank placement n is equal to 1 so power loss reduction expression is represented by this and if you differentiate with respect to c and by equating to zero you get the optimal value of c As two third and x is equal to two third of into one upon one minus lambda, and then power loss reduction expression will come as eight upon nine into alpha one minus lambda. So for lambda is equal to zero, that is informally distributed load. The power loss reduction will be delta p is equal to eight upon nine per unit for the capacitor placed at x is equal to two upon third per unit distance, and with this capacitor bank size at two upon three per unit. so we can say that this is the bell used to th two third thumb rule for capacitor placement like for informal distributor load we put capacitor at distance of two two third per unit distance and with capacitor bank size of two third per unit now moving to this next uh, moving to the next module in the final exam what is the percentage of questions asked for my assignments so i would just say that uh, i can say most of the problems are similar to the assignments and tutorials if you have covered the problems then you will definitely get good grades sure and sort it will not directly means the problem will not same some problems may or may not be same but definitely it will be similar in the next module is planning power distribution planning economic aspects and here one problem is based on the immediate marginal and incremental cost that i have covered in the tutorial session so immediate cost In the cost, in the that portion of the cost that is exist in the current plant system of configuration or level of use, and depending on the application, this can include all our portion of the initial fixed cost and all our parts of the variable cost. While this marginal cost is the slope of the cost function at the current operating point, so you can see this figure, embedded cost, this one, and this marginal cost in the cost function at the current operating point, and this embedded cost includes. all our portion of initial fixed cost and all our parts of the variable cost so immediate cost includes all the fixed and variable cost while this marginal cost that includes the cost function at the current operating point so this point is usually the point at which current immediate cost is defined and incremental cost 
in the cost per into a specific jump or increment. For example, this increment cost serving an additional 17 MBA from certain substation or incremental cost of loss of vein load of feed decreases from 5.3 to 5.0 MBA. A marginal cost and incremental cost both express the rate of change of cost with respect to base variable, but they differ substantially because of the discontinuities and learning in the cost relationship. Therefore, it is important to distinguish currently and use that too. So in this example, you can see this marginal cost as a slope that is cost per unit change and an operating point while this incremental cost has a slope and both from and to operating points. So you can clearly see the figure from the figure that what is difference between marginal cost and incremental cost. So in, in, incremental cost has a starting and end point while marginal cost is defined at certain instant. Now this uh, discounted and point board factor, you can define this point board factor as 1 upon 1 plus D and this present uh, if uh, FW represents the value of money required three years later and PW represents the value of money required for expansion planning then this present board related as future board into P upon T and this levelized analysis is the method of applying time value of money analysis to initial and future cost to develop an equivalent cost annual cost and this levelized value of Q over two years is denoted by this expression so you need to remember this expression because it is slightly little bit difficult q into d up into 1 plus d upon t upon 1 plus d upon t minus 1 where d is this discount rate and q is this present worth of the money and in the next module we have power system system planning different models and solution strategy where we have uh, the optimization has been introduced so what is the goal of optimization either to maximize or minimize certain objectives which can be translated to some mathematical function called an objective function and uh, an objective function may be of single objective or multi objective and single objective objective function means that either to minimize or ma maximize that function and here this x is called decision vector which consists of number of decision variables optimization variables problem variables the same it uh, x is having same different names so x can be single variable or sing that is called single variable of objective function and if x can be in dimensional vector then it is called as multi variable objective function and for this multi objective optimization function from the name it says that it has m number of objective functions and uh, this may having some constraints and there are uh, some equality constant and inequality constant inequality constants this equal sign comes while inequality constants this less than or greater than sign comes now this uh, single objective mono objective optimization problems the, it can be of two types unconstrained type be, uh, you have to either minimize or maximize this function without any constraint so that is called an unconstant single objective optimization problem while in this constant optimization problem you have to minimize or maximize this function with respect to certain constant certain equality or unequality inequality constant in constant optimization problem the solution which satisfy the constant are called feasible solution and the best feasible solution in view of the objective function is called the optimal solution and this optimal solution can be defined to can be further uh, can be further can be further uh, categorized into local optima and glo global optima local optima that means the best solution among its feasible neighborhood solution while this global optima the best solution among all feasible solutions now coming to this multi-objective optimization problems it involves more than one objective function that are to minimize or maximize and it's subject to equality constant or inequality constant and the answer for this multi-objective optimization problem is that the best trade-off between the competitive objectives so in multi objective optimization the goodness of solution is determined by the dominance so uh, the answer for the multi objective uh, formulation um, uh, problem is that we have to trade off between the competitive objectives and the solution is determined the dominance so the one way is that pareto optimal solution that is non dominated solution set it is having given a set of solution the non dominated solution set is set of all the solution that are non dominated not dominated by any number of solution set and the non dominated set solution of, uh, solution of the entire feasible decision space is called the Pareto optimal set or solution 
and the boundary defined by the set of all point met from the Pareto optimal set is called the Pareto optimal front. So this is the Pareto optimal front and this is, these are the Pareto optimal solution. These are non-dominated solution set. So Pareto optimal solutions uh, solution set are the non-dominated uh, non-dominated -dom solution set. So this is very important. Pareto optimal solution set are called non-dominated solution set. Now there are various types of optimization problems based on this uh, linearity, convexity, defensivity, and decision variables. And next we are how we can classify this solution strategy. We can classify uh, it as mathematical logic based algorithm. It is consist of this mixed integer branch and bound and you can see this uh, metahistic algorithms and then this population based metahistic algorithms are badly used because it has various advantages. Now for this uh, summary for solution strategy that in most of the multi objective planning the population based metahistic algorithms are used because multi point search helps to maintain a set of paradox approximation solution in a single run they can handle non-linear and convex non differences problems effectively they don't suffer from the curse of dimensionality and this drawback of population based metaphysical algorithms is that convergence is not always granted now the next part next module is that reconfiguration of power distribution network that come that also comes under this power distribution planning so Reconfiguration is to change the topology of network. We are not developing a brand. We are not developing a new network. So conversion may be varied with manual or automatic switching operations and the change in network conversion is performed by opening, sectionalizing switch or closing this switch of network and the two conditions should always meet. The first condition is that all demands should, should shall be met during reconfiguration and the second is that reality of the network shall be maintained. That is the basic nature of the power distribution network. Now, what should be the optimization objective? What can be the optimization objective for optimal network configuration? These are the, can be objectives for optimal network configuration, maximization of service restoration that you can say that maximization of reliability or minimization of service interruption, energy loss minimization, feeder load balancing or transformer load balancing, prevention of transformer and feeder overload and so on. And there are some cons and these are the these are the constraints and this not need to be always uh, taken as constants in all the optimization problem here I have given what can be the constants for this optimization problem for equality constant and inequality constant and for this uh, optimal network reconfiguration there are certain uh, you can classify this optimization approaches and solution as a strategy based on this uh, figure and here we have one problem based on the CLLI so I have shown here now in the last uh, lecture we have covered this distribution system with distribution natures and some problems from the smart grid and automation and you can recap this uh, how we estimate the bind energy at a site so first is the power available in a bind and all the power available in bind cannot be utilized by the bind turbine so this power coefficient comes into picture so pt is equal to sip into p0 and P0 is equal to half rho A U0 Q where U is the, uh, U is the uh, binder speed and this electrical power output will be the will be the power strip of bin turbine into the efficiency where efficiency the uh, this combined gear generated efficiency and another expression that TSR lambda it, it is the T per speed ratio and T per speed ratio is defined as the rotor T per speed to the bind speed. Rotor T per speed here we take the tangential speed of uh, tangential speed of rotor. So tangential speed of rotor that means tangential speed means V is equal to R omega. So tangential speed and angular speed both are different many. So here this rotor T per speed is taken as the tangential speed. So tensile speed if you have uh, if you have article so this is taken as tensile speed so here you can define this you can get the expression for lambda that is r omega upon u naught so this is very important now and another expression that how can you estimate the bind speed at height h 
using this equation u is equal to u not h upon h not into a where a is the roughness or friction or coefficient and next is the power curve and this power curve is very very important for the bend in uh, for the bend energy conversion system till the cutting speed there is no power extraction from the bend turbine and up beyond this cutting speed this power is directly proportional to the cube of uh, bend speed that is u q and till the rated speed this varies upon this uh, bend speed and beyond this rated speed beyond the rated speed this power gets saturated till the shutdown speed and beyond this speed you have to just shut down your bend turbine so that it does not get damaged so this is very important at cutting speed at rated speed and between this rated speed you need to compute the power extracted from the turbine based on the bend speed and before cutting speed this power output is minimal or you can say zero and after rated speed it gets saturated till the shutdown speed and after shutdown speed you have to shut down your have to shut down your bin turbine otherwise is otherwise it gets damaged and shutdown speed is also called as furling speed or cut off speed so that's all from my side till here if you have any doubt or any clarification want just ask me first thank you sir for such long lecture continuous no problem. yes this is revision session that's why it's it gets longer and uh, all the best for your final exam i think it is it, it is on 20th right yes sir yeah so be calm and just uh, do your uh, assignment uh, revise your assignment and tutorials and the class lectures that's enough assignment is very important one thing i will sure okay sir thank you so much sir for your uh, valuable effort and lessons yeah thank you all of you for joining the session and have a interactive and to make it interactive because for recorded session it's very difficult to get the audience yeah thank you gokul and peer jasni alex all of you and all the best for your final exam good night have a nice dinner thank you bye